Hey, Ari and Al, guys, I gotta do some recording. Could you be a little bit quieter, please? Yeah. And could you go back up to the pool, okay? Rinse your feet. I think I'm just gonna leave that in. Oh, yeah, have to yeah, stop it, I'll leave that in. I, <laughs> I had, had started the recording and then I was like, ah, oh, the kids are being rat bags. I'll wait until that quietens down and then I'll open my beer <laughs> and start the update. But no, now that I think about it, I just want to do a little bit of, you know, not everything in life is completely messed up at the moment. And I appreciate that I'm sort of saying that sitting in a very nice environment here, but I want to talk about that as well, because that sort of came up yesterday too. Uh, I just, I don't think you can sort of start the video today without sort of talking about how how weird stuff has gotten because it's it's weird for everyone in one way or another and certainly to one degree or another um, so maybe we just talk about what it's what it's like here at the moment because it's it's an odd kind of paradox where for those of you listening rather than than watching the video uh, I'm sitting on a boat in my backyard it's perfect weather I'm in a singlet it's what's the temperature now 27 degrees it's come down to 27 degrees it's just after 5 p.m. it's gonna be 31 tomorrow which is which is just lovely and <clears throat> Australia is kind of a, a bit of a, a funny paradox I guess where we're very isolated from the rest of the world uh, by nature of being an island continent we've had the onset of virus uh, happen later and by all accounts somewhat slower but other than that kind of tracking with the rest of the world I guess but you know we, we have had a, a bit of a bit of luxury in terms of of, uh, of our, our distance and separation from everywhere else and of course once you're here the the population density is a lot lower okay places like Sydney and all that sort of thing is you know still still big concrete jungles uh, I worked very hard for many years to get myself out of that concrete jungle which is why I'm here in the the beachier sort of jungle so um, we've had that advantage and of course the, the weather as well I mean this is not the, the season where you have runny noses and people sneezing all over the place and that sort of thing and, and, and frankly even the season that is it doesn't happen much here because it's uh, it's always kind of nice weather so in, you know in, in a way that's that's great uh, as of today so I am recording this on where are you Friday 20 March there's still it mostly normality so the the schools have not been closed <coughs> certainly not by, by government mandate there are schools that that are closing uh, particularly during this week so that's you know that's obviously yet to change I was down at the shops today there was a there was a queue at the bakery now, not like a crazy queue not like oh my god what's happening but just just people at the door which wouldn't normally happen but the coffee shops were full and the restaurants were full and if, for me personally that's not something that I I want to do at the moment I don't want to go to a restaurant or a coffee shop I do want to support our local restaurants I am going to be ordering some pizza very very shortly as well for Friday and pizza and movie night with the kids but it, it's weird because for the most part it feels normal and of course in this environment here it's it, it's particularly lovely at, at the best of times let alone when when shit's getting crazy over us at the moment and and then I look at the Either I look at the news, oh my God, I've got to stop looking at the news. I'm, I'm literally trying to just like look at it in the morning, look at it in the evening, absorb the most important things and then just try and, and not take on board a lot of the hyperbole. Um, but I speak to friends a lot. So um, I've been speaking to a lot of friends in, in Europe and hearing what things like over there and it's just like, oh my God, this is this is crazy. I I thought I'd do it on the boat today because I, I tweeted a photo yesterday where I was sitting on the back of it, my daughter was sitting on the very back of the fishing rod and this is an environment as you can see from the video where there are no other people around uh, we can see neighbors sometimes but this particular location there's rarely people outdoors there's a there's a lot of vacant places actually just because a lot of people are overseas and they come back I know the place right there is owned by some Chinese folks who, who seem to holiday here uh, probably not going to be doing much holidaying from China for a while in Australia so that's that's still vacant but you know we sort of wave and have a chat over the fence but you, you can do the distancing thing and we're extremely fortunate to be able to do that and still have this nice lifestyle so anyway I came out here took a photo and when I took it I was like 
you know, some people are probably going to get upset that it's a nice environment. And then I was like, honestly, for fuck's sake, like out of everything that is happening at the moment, if, if that's what you take away with this, I am upset that you're in a nice environment. Let me express my upsetness via the means of Twitter, as opposed to the, the, the context of the photo. And just to be clear as well, this is, I've had like two people upset about this. Um, and, and I always go by the ratio. If there's a couple of people, that's fine, so long as the vast majority are okay. So I actually tweeted and said, you know, tell me what isolation looks for you, uh, what it looks like for you, because it's obviously very different to all of us. Now, I actually got some lovely photos of, of people in different parts of the world. Uh, obviously, the ones in Australia are going to look awesome because it's summer and there's beaches and things like that. Uh, other parts in the world are, are, are quite different. Some of them are very, very pretty as well. So I am curious. I'll link to that tweet, actually, in my in my update. Uh, if you If you are in a part of the world, I'm just curious to see what isolation looks like. It's not necessarily all bad. Uh, honestly, like I really need to make time to sort of sit there and enjoy it with the kids. Uh, and it was actually nice sitting on the back, having a beer, watching my daughter fishing and the kids going a little bit crazy in the pool now. So let me talk a little bit more about what it does look like for us here. With the caveat that yes, it is very nice. No, don't lose your freaking mind over the fact that it's very nice. <laughs> I will, maybe I, I don't know if I remember to link to it or not, but I've written a couple of things around what I did with my career to, to have these choices in life. And <laughs> I'm having a water bomb fight in the pool. So, uh, so that's kind of pertinent. In fact, the, I think it was like New Year's Eve 2018, I wrote something about financial tips for uh, technology professionals, and I'd, I'd love to follow that up again at, at an appropriate time because that's, I'll tell you what, that's actually very, very important at the moment. But anyway, what it looks like for us here is that, uh, you know, look, we can, we can still go out and, and ride bikes. Uh, that, that's fine. We can still go down to the beach. Uh, obviously, having a boat, we can still get around and do that. Um, uh, a huge number of houses here on the Gold Coast where I live have swimming pools, so people can still go out and enjoy that. Uh, in fact, there must be tens of thousands of houses that are on the water, like this one. So fun trivia fact, the Gold Coast has more canals than Venice and Amsterdam combined. And if anyone's, if, if you're curious, because you've got downtime at the moment, go to Google Maps, go to Gold Coast, it's just south of Brisbane in Australia, and have a look at the waterways, like it's insane. There's so many places on like here, man-made canals. Like literally there was ocean and then they pumped in a bunch of sand, think like Dubai at a very small scale, and now you got waterfront homes. So that does make life really nice. I, I do worry a little bit that I, I think there's a little bit of complacency here where people are sort of going, ah, you know, look, so long as you stay a certain distance away, it'll be fine. I think the school's not closing is, is uh, out of step with the rest of the world at the moment. I'm sure there are reasons for that. I'll be surprised, to be honest, if I have this, this weekly update next week and they, they haven't been closed, so we'll see. But, you know, all that aside, I, um, I wanted to sort of tweet the photo of here because this is what it is like for us at the moment. Now, someone made a comment about privilege and I was, frankly, I get a little bit upset about that when it's used in a context of you have something nice, I am upset that you have something nice. That just does not hold water for me. And if you go back through some of my talks, my Hack Your Career talk, for example, where I show what was required to get here, or the financial tips thing and the sacrifices that required over you know, really a couple of decades in order to be able to have this choice, privilege is suddenly indistinguishable from just working very, very hard and working at the right thing. Hard work alone doesn't get you there. Now, I don't want to go off on that tangent because I don't think this is really the time to do it. And again, I really would like to do a follow-up. But um, yeah, I, I don't feel the need to then try and like censor life in order to placate someone who may be unhappy that life is good for someone else. That just, out of the priorities in the world today, that just doesn't seem to be up there. Now, I've for, depending on where I cut the start of this, nearly 10 minutes. So I do want to move on because there are multiple cyber things that I have written this week. I mean, this is one of the one of the positive outcomes of actually having a bit of isolation and obviously not traveling and things like this is that I do get more time. And what I'd really love to, in fact, I had a, a good chat with my good mate Lars Clint today. And, and Lars, I, I won't tell you what he messaged me, but he messaged me something that, that, that was a positive outcome of the whole thing. And I was like, mate, I, I just wanted to call you 
just to talk about positive stuff because there are positive things that come out of this. There's a shitload of negative stuff, don't get me wrong, totally understand that. Let us try and find the positive and the things that we can do well. Now, the first thing that I wrote, which is a positive out of this, is that Scott Helm and I are running my Hack Yourself First workshop virtually three times over the next month and a bit. Now, we have been running this workshop for years and years and years. I must have done it 80 plus times now, so many times before. And I have done it multiple times virtually as well, like literally sitting up there in my office recording the whole thing. And what uh, what has always worked really well about the virtual thing is that I get to stay home, I don't have to travel anywhere. And then the other people that join in don't have to travel somewhere, like they can stay wherever they are in the world. Uh, virtual actually has a few other upsides, and I'm, I'm saying this like pre-coronavirus and all this sort of stuff as well. Um, Incidentally, if you're thinking coronavirus is a good time to drink corona, no, there was never a good time to drink corona. Go and get a decent bloody beer. Anyway, back on topic. So, um, so running this virtually has a few other very positive outcomes as well. So pre-virus and all this sort of stuff, one of the positive outcomes is that when you run virtually and everyone is sitting there at their own machines, at their own desks, these days in their own home, it does tend to level the voices a bit because when you know how you when you're in a room full of people and there's often someone who's dominant and discussion centers around them and they become the focus of attention so one of the great things that i have found with virtual workshops is that it levels the playing field everyone gets a voice everyone gets a say and if you're a more introverted sort of person and there are a lot of those within this industry you get your say as well it's much easier to pose questions than if you're sitting there in a classroom full of people and you're like, oh, I should have put my hand up or say something or not. So that has always been a positive outcome of this. So that's one. Now, uh, a couple of other things. In this particular scenario, running workshops virtually is massively more cost effective for people joining. So let me talk about the three different workshops and then I'll give you the numbers as well. So. Uh, we are going to run an extra special, extra special because it wouldn't have happened otherwise, extra special workshop to suit Australian time zones next week. So Thursday 26, Friday 27 of March is going to go from 9 to 5 Sydney, Melbourne time. We are also going to do NDC Copenhagen from here for me in Manchester for Scott, because Scott's not going anywhere either, on the 1st and the 2nd of April. And we're going to do NDC Porto on the 21st and the 22nd of April as well. And obviously both the European ones will be friendly to European time zones. They'll be like 9 to 10 local, which would put it at, a, sorry, 9 to 10, it's longer than that. 9 to 5 local, which will put it at about 8 to 4 UK time if you are in the UK. Kids still seem happy. Now few different things about how we're going to run this which I think makes it much better. We're really, really, really conscious that we don't want to take an in-person workshop, chuck it online, it becomes basically what it was before but with the soul sucked out of it, you know, and all the human interaction, all this sort of stuff. We are super conscious of this. And Scott and I and the folks at NDC, so these are running under the banner of NDC, I'm going to talk more about NDC in a moment, had very, very lengthy discussions about this over the last couple of weeks before we even announced anything publicly about how do we make sure that we keep soul and engagement and interaction. And part of the answer to that is that Scott and I are running these in tag team format. So when they're in Australia, Scott's going to run the first half and I'll run the second half on both day one and day two. When they're in, the, in uh, Europe, they'll be the other way around just so that I don't have to stay up too late, he doesn't have to stay up too late. And what it means is, is that you get both of us. Now, by getting both of us, we do, we'll do roughly three and a half hours uh, each day because it's like three and a half hours, hour for lunch, three and a half hours to wrap the thing up. So that's number one, we get to stay fresh. And this is actually one of the things I learned running them remotely too. I started getting to the point where I was like, look, partly because of time zones, but also partly because it's actually really draining as a presenter just to talk to a computer, we're gonna run them as four half days. Now in this case, we're gonna do two full days, but I do two half days, Scott does two half days. So first thing. Second thing is, we're gonna have an hour where Scott and I are together in the middle of the day. Call it the lunch break, but let's face it, a lot of people aren't leaving their homes at the moment, so it's like, yes, you can take your sandwich to your desk or whatever it may be, and you can ask us anything. Anything you like uh, related to the course, InfoSec, whatever else. Scott and I are gonna banter with each other as well. There's going to be personality and character and soul and all the rest of it. 
And then what I'm going to do, certainly for the Australia ones, and I'll figure out what we do with the Europe ones, uh, after, after day two, so this will be 5 p.m. Friday, so it'll be bang on about one week from now, actually, we're going to have virtual beers. So I'm going to take the camera, the mics, everything. I will probably come down here and sit in my boat and take a beer, and I'm going to talk to everyone else, and we will just banter about anything that you want to banter about because I don't want to lose that. In fact, I've seen a few things on social media about people you know, out, even outside this industry, just going, yeah, like now we're just having virtual drinks. Like a whole bunch of people get on WebEx or something like that, uh, and they, they literally just have videos and drinks and whatever else it may be. So, you know, good on them. People are adapting. Thumbs up to that. So that's the way we're going to run the Australia one. Same with the ones in Europe. Uh, again, the I'm going to be doing the first half of the day, so it might be Scott doing the virtual beers. Otherwise, I'm going to be sitting there at like 3 a.m. trying to have a beer, which I think is not going to be great for me. And of course, if you don't drink beer, that's fine. Beer is a euphemism for a social time. You can drink a cup of tea, like whatever you want. This isn't intended to turn everyone into alcoholics while they're sitting at home with nothing else to do. All right, so that's the first bit. Now, the, the, the next bit on NDC as well. So... NDC has been uh, an enormously important part of my life since 2014 when I did my first international talk, which was NDC Oslo. And I've done every NDC Oslo since then and a bunch of the other NDC things over a period of many years. And their, their success has been a big part of my success. So I am really conscious that in an environment like this, what do you think happens when a, a, a company just runs conferences and then nobody wants to go to conferences anymore? And then they've already got conferences booked and they've got venues and hotels and flights and everything booked. So it's a hell of a hard time on them. And I want to make sure, and Scott wants to make sure as well, that we help NDC get through this period because we want to make sure that when we do come out of the end of this cycle, however long it takes, that we still have these conferences. Because as much as I think the remote ones are going to be awesome, we want to make sure that we can actually do the physical ones again and that there is an NDC around us to run them. Now that said, I touched on the pricing. So just looking at the numbers here. So normally in Australia, we would run just the two day workshop. So if you had to come to like Sydney or Melbourne and done my workshop for two days, uh, 1,790 Australian dollars, that is X GST for the Aussies. It's now 800 bucks. So that's a massive, massive reduction. Uh, the Copenhagen one is, uh, it would normally be, what was it normally? 7,900 krona. That is now down to 4,000, so almost half the price. NDC Porto would have been 1,000 euros. Uh, actually, what did I say here? Uh, it was 800 euros for the early bird one. Incidentally, the other prices were all early bird as well. So it was like the cheapest, cheapest, cheapest ticket you could have gotten in Australia is $1,790. Now it's 800 bucks. Uh, NDC Porto used to be 800 pounds, sorry, pounds, where are we? 800 euros for the early bird. Uh, 1,000 for the regular price, 500 euros. So half of what the regular price would be. So these are massively reduced prices. They allow people who come along to these events to learn exactly the same stuff they would have learned in person, do it for a fraction of the price, and, uh, and also do it in a way that's gonna help one of the conferences, which so many of us love, actually be sustainable and do more things in the future. So. Win-win for all. Uh, Australia, we have sold enough tickets now to run it. We've had a bunch of sales already, which is fantastic. If we only had like one person or two people, we would have had to go, hang on a moment. <laughs> and incidentally, it's not three people either. Uh, we would have had to go, hang on a moment, like does this even make sense? But we have well and truly passed the point where we, we've met our minimum threshold. So please pile in on that. We haven't set a maximum threshold. That would be a nice problem to have help us have that problem and we will set a maximum if we get there because we want to make sure we can give everyone enough TLC. All right, so that was blog post number one about running these workshops. Oh, incidentally, I just noticed right up the top of this, someone else made a similar comment to me recently. There is an embedded Simpsons piece about crisis opportunity. Now, if you're a Simpsons fan, you remember crisis opportunity. At least it goes to Homer. The Chinese word for crisis is the same as opportunity. Uh, I saw someone in their signature actually today talking about this directly as it relates to the virus situation at the moment. And I put it at the start of this blog post because I thought it was very, very relevant. So the opportunity in this crisis is the ability to go and do one of these workshops without having to travel at a fraction of the price. Take the opportunity. Okay, that's that one. Now, blog post number two, also related to the fact that so many of us are now working from home. Scott and I are doing our Everything is Cyberbroken talk 
over the air for free broadcast via YouTube. This is a talk that has never been recorded before for very good reason. But we've basically just gone, literally, fuck it, we're going to do it online. Uh, it's going to be available to people. It'll be recorded. You'll be able to watch it later if you want. We will have to be a bit more cautious than what we might have been in front of a live studio audience where we would have just done whatever we wanted to do. But it's going to be the same talk, which is basically Scott and I bantering about cyber stuff for, uh, for normally an hour, but it's online. People don't really have anywhere else to go. So anyway, we'll do that. Uh, it'd normally be like both of us drinking a few beers, talking about uh, things that are industry related, but making it fun. And I've embedded a couple of tweets from people here. The, the one I like the most, this is the <laughs> embedded tweet at the top, is we did this as the party talk at NDC London in January last year. And, and Harry Miller says, it's like Top Gear for nerds. I say, like, okay, I'll buy that. That's sweet. I'm happy with that. Uh, I put a, another embedded tweet here that shows you what it looks like in Oslo. So I've got in, an embedded one here from uh, July this year when we did it in Oslo. And it's just a room full of hundreds and hundreds of people all the way stacked up to the ceiling. I don't know when we're going to be able to do that next. But it, again, I want to make sure that we have the option. I want to make sure that these conferences survive and get through this period so that we can do the whole thing again. So we're going to do that online. That's going to be... 9 a.m. London time this coming Monday, which is the 23rd. It's going to be 7 p.m. Brisbane time, which is my time. I am going to be up in the office doing it with all my good recording gear and lighting and everything. So we're going to make it as professional as we possibly can. Uh, a few little surprises and things we're going to drop in there, things I won't talk about just yet, but things I've got to set up and have a bit of fun with. Scott doesn't know the content. The content is always largely infosec centric. There will also be a bunch of it which is taking the piss out of Scott because who doesn't enjoy that? So it'll be same old show in most of those ways, but it'll be online. Everyone can get there. Everyone can get it for free. There's no registration, nothing like that. We're not siphoning off or harvesting your data. It is literally, let's just have some fun. That said, moving on to the third thing. This one is not fun. Now, this one. This is, okay, it's largely a rant. I started really losing my patience. <laughs> it's so unlike me. Really losing my patience at data breach disclosure. So yesterday I wrote a blog post. The title is, there is a serious lack of corporate responsibility during data breach disclosures. And the thing that's really starting to bug me with disclosure is the number of times I disclose the organization I'm disclosing to receives the disclosure and then deletes it. And I give, I actually give three different examples here. So I've got, <laughs> I've got an example here. Here's a good one if you're bored. Adult fan fiction. Maybe after the kids have gone to bed. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's not visual, don't worry. But it is... Uh, erotica in novel format and it's about like vampires and werewolves who let's just say love each other very much and they had a data breach and i attempted to disclose it i emailed their support number or oh, support number what is this again email we still have email emailed their uh their, their contact address there and they basically just dismissed it and when eventually the data did get loaded they were very unhappy about that and got very upset and i actually embed part of a talk i did at another ndc which actually talks through the process of what happened then. But I've given a couple of other examples here, and, and these are the ones that, that were the catalyst to writing this blog post, because it was just two things very close to each other, where in both cases, the messages went through and they were ignored. So in one of these cases, and I'm not naming either of these companies because their communication since connecting to them has been good. So I don't want to throw them under the bus for that. So in one of these cases, uh, I emailed them. It was something like about eight days went past. No one got in touch. I eventually go to Twitter. And when I go to Twitter, I'll say something like, hey, does anyone have a security contact at? And then I at the company, assuming that they're actually on Twitter. Now, I know what people assume as soon as I ask for a security contact. And they're usually right. <laughs> so I, I understand the significance of putting that tweet out. And I don't do it lightly. But I do do it to try and get the attention of the organization. Because the only other option is, is that I eventually just go live. And this is what happened with adult fan fiction. I go live and the data goes into Have I Been Poem, people get emails, there's a tweet that goes out, and then the organization figures it out and then they take it seriously. I don't want that. 
I want a private dialogue because a private dialogue gives the organization the opportunity to plug whatever hole it is that someone sucked all their data out of. It gives them an opportunity to prepare their response to the questions that they're going to get from their customers. It gives them an opportunity to actually notify their customers, notify authorities, uh, their local regulator, whoever it is that they need to notify. They can do all that without the duress of the first thing they know is it's just like all over Twitter. That's my last resort. But I'm only going to invest so much of my time getting there. So in this case just here, after someone finally got in touch with me, I said, I actually emailed your service weeks ago and never got a response. See attached, it explains the background. And I attached the email I sent to them, which is like, hey, you've had a data breach. You need to take this seriously. Here's information about me. Look me up, all this sort of thing. And they responded. Um, they said, it seems that your email to our customer service team was deleted by a user there as they thought it was spam. Now I'm going to come back to this. The main point here is that they did receive it. They read it. They deleted it. Now I replied, I'm very surprised to hear someone treated that message as spam. It came complete with proper SPF and DKIM records, clearly explained the situation and provided references to verify the legitimacy of the message. Assuming the breach is legitimate, that's almost three weeks that have now passed where your customer's data has been extensively redistributed and almost certainly abused to their detriment. So sorry, this particular one I think was three weeks. The next one was about eight days. And, uh, and they replied and said it cleared our strict email filtering. Yeah, because it's a perfectly legitimate email. Unfortunately, it got through to our salespeople who deleted it rather than passing it on to myself or others in the IT team. So there was that one. Uh, another one, I this was the eight-day one. I DM'd via Twitter and also via Facebook message. Uh, I DM'd them and I said, look, you've had a data breach. Also, in both these cases, the data was already on a popular hacking forum, already downloaded multiple times, exchanged between other people. There's people on the forum going, hey, thank you, very nice. You know, let me uh, share this. Good find, good hack, whatever else it may be. So there's people literally abusing this data. This is not like we have time to play with. So when I eventually got in touch with this next one, this is now, you know, over a week later, I said to them, I DM'd your service eight days ago and sent a Facebook DM too. Why hasn't there been a response? Now, my unhappiness probably comes through <laughs> in those tweets because I was very unhappy. I was like, guys, I tried. I really, really tried to help you deal with this correctly. They replied and said, hi, Troy. Apologies that your tweet did not get escalated through the right channels and thanks for bringing it to our attention. Not really answering the question. Not answering the question at all. Now, in response to this, a bunch of people have said, your message seems like spam. You should not provide people a link because I have a link to my about page. You should tell them to Google you instead. <laughs> so, well, yeah, that doesn't sound like spam at all. Plus, if someone wanted to impersonate me, they could just say the same thing. Other people saying uh, things like, oh, geez, let me have a look here. Uh, buh, 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 buh. There's no easy way to differentiate the genuine from the fake and because the poor soul having to do the initial sort through, it's just, I don't disagree with the comments insofar as there's a lot of junk which is not that far removed from the sort of messaging I send them. So for example, I receive messages from people all the time which is like, hi, I'd like to let you know about a serious security vulnerability with your website. And I, just like Scott, we've had this discussion many times and many other people are like, oh shit, like what's, what's wrong? Like what's this serious vulnerability? And we'll go back and we'll say, you know, well, 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 what's, what's the problem? They go, do you have a bug bounty? It's like, mate, I've, I run this thing in a shoestring. No, I don't have a freaking bug bounty. I have not <laughs> gone down that road. <coughs> Just tell me what the problem is. And every single time so far, it has come back to something like, I ran your site through SSL Labs and you're using some sort of obsolete Cypher Suite. Or I use securityheaders.com and it came back and said you don't have a content security policy. Uh, incidentally, when you do that with Have I Been Pwned, first of all, that's because I block Have I Been Pwned. That's, does Have I Been Pwned block Have I Been Pwned? No. That's because I block a whole bunch of automated traffic, which includes Scott's service. If you run it over my blog, it comes back and says you don't have a CSP, but I do have a CSP. I've just got it in meta tags because I don't have the ability to inject it via the headers because of ghost. Another argument that I'm having with Scott. Point is, people get very opportunistic. They send a bunch of spam. I am sympathetic to organizations who have to deal with it. This is why we have constructs like security.txt. Put a security.txt in your .well-known directory 
have information in there about who to contact and where to report security incidents, job done. Now we can at least funnel the security stuff down one channel, separate it from all the other customer service stuff that goes to another channel. You're still gonna get junk, you're still gonna to have to triage this stuff, but at least it starts to allow a focused stream of security related stuff. There is a part of me which doesn't care too much if someone files it as junk, and, and here's why. I need to be confident that I have taken reasonable steps to report a data breach before I load it into Have I Been Pwned. Now, I still have a bit of grey movement here in terms of what reasonable is, and it differs from case to case. So, for example, if it's an organisation that I know has, let's say it's an open, an open S3 bucket, still happens all the time, a little of Elasticsearch these days too. Let's just say it's an open database, publicly facing, and if I jump up and publicise that there's been a breach due to an open database, that obviously shines a spotlight on them, which could make things much worse. So I might deal with that differently to, uh, here is something which is already on a popular hacking forum, the data's being shared all over the place, it's been SQL injected six months ago. Okay, different story. So look, I don't have a good answer to this. I, I just despair. <laughs> I really despair that we haven't been able to, to get on top of this as an industry. And, and th this is like one of the things that, that I would actually really like to address as part of the Project Svelbar aftermath. Have I been paying not being sold? Going to do a whole bunch of different things. One of the things I really want to do is tackle this as an industry. Now, stay tuned for that, because this is something I've been giving a lot of thought to for a lot of time, and I do have ideas around this. So, three blog posts. When was the last time I actually wrote three blog posts in a week? Amazing. Christ opportunity. So, last thing this week is sponsor, brand new sponsor, Chronicle from Google, redefining security analytics. You can learn about their platform design for a world that thinks in petabytes, which of course is, uh, petabytes are the new gig? Uh, no, they're, they're, they're new terabytes, aren't they? Same. And the next bytes are new petabytes. I hope I got that in the right order. Anyway, it's a lot of bytes. Big thanks to Chronicle from Google for sponsoring the blog this week. Uh, it's nice to have some new sponsors on as well. I did have a little period there where frankly I just got so bogged down, particularly in the very tail end of Project Svelbar, I got way behind in sponsors. Uh, I now have a pretty healthy pipeline of sponsors coming up as well, which is probably a good time for them because I'm going to be writing a lot more stuff. It's going to be a lot more people reading my stuff. Just reminded me of one other thing that happened this week. Have I been pwned hit Japanese TV? Now, I've spent a lot of time in Japan and they are very Japanese insofar as English literacy, let's just say, has a much lower rate there than somewhere like Hong Kong or Singapore, or of course, most of Europe. So I was actually a little bit surprised that it got really, uh, really successful there. And I had a much bigger spike in traffic than I did with that whole Martin Lawrence, Martin Lawrence, sorry, Martin Lewis. Martin Lawrence is a different actor. Martin Lewis Money Show in the UK. When was that? Like six weeks ago or something. When the world was more normal. Massive spike of traffic. Lost absolutely zero requests. Everything went through beautifully. So big thanks to everyone in Japan that hit Have I Been Pwned and smashed it. And everything still ran fine. So totally, totally happy with that. All right. So look, that's it for this update. Uh, it's, I know it's just been a, an absolute mix of different stuff. Uh, I hope particularly the intro stuff about what life is like here for us uh, can be taken just purely in the context of I'm, I'm fascinated about what it looks like for, for everyone and, uh, and I, I think people are probably fascinated about what it's like in Australia at the moment. I suspect it's going to be different in a, in a week from now. But uh, we'll talk about that then. Scott and I will definitely talk about that Monday night and if you can get yourself into one of those workshops with Scott and I, we'll definitely talk about that with beers in seven days from now for the folks in Australia. Uh, and in the weeks after that for the Copenhagen and the Porto events as well. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this and it's been a little bit different to usual, uh, but uh, the show must go on. Thanks for watching. <laughs>